Greetings and welcome to this interactive continuing education program at the Euro PCR eCourse 2020. Originally, we were to be together in Paris in May. Uh, instead, we will be joining you virtually today uh, with the same August panel we would have had live to discuss controversies in antiplatelet therapy for the secondary prevention of cardiovascular events. I'm Charlie Pollock. I am an emergency physician at the University of Mississippi in Jackson, Mississippi, U.S. Uh, and as you see on the title slide here, we have a great faculty, uh, which I'll be introducing in a moment. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals. It's accredited by Academic CME, a joint accreditor that has designated this material for a maximum of one hour AMA PRA category one credits, as well as by the European Accreditation Council for CME, which has designated this material for one hour of European CME credit 2020. We thank you very much for joining us. I am very pleased and honored to be joined by Dr. Tobias Geisler from University Hospital Tübingen in Germany, by Dr. Gabriel Stegg from Université de Paris Hôpital Bichot, excuse me, Bichat in Paris, uh, Rob Story from University of Sheffield in Sheffield, UK, and Dr. Uwe Zimmer from the uh, Hospital of the City of Ludwigshafen in Germany. We're going to be discussing in expert roundtable fashion controversies in secondary prevention of acute coronary syndrome, particularly focusing on antiplatelet therapy, which is a, a topic that continues to evolve. Uh, and I think over time has uh, certainly improved our outcomes in patients who have experienced an ACS or had a stent placed. That's because we focused on this target. This, of course, is the platelet, a remarkably complex tiny cell in the body that uh, is instrumental in thrombosis, particularly in coronary arteries and around foreign bodies such as stents. We've identified so many receptors that are associated with platelet activation and aggregation, and we've made dramatic progress over the last couple of decades, starting with aspirin and in uh, interfering with this process so that we can hopefully control pathologic thrombosis without giving too much increased risk to pathologic bleeding. Briefly, the controversies we'll be discussing are when to initiate P2Y12 receptor blockade. The P2Y12 receptor, of course, is the ADP receptor. ADP is a very potent activator of platelets. Uh, and this uh, oral blockade can be started uh, upstream, that is prior to uh, definition of the coronary uh, anatomy, or in the cath lab, either orally after definition of the anatomy or with an intravenous agent, uh, Kangrelar. Uh, there's no argument about when to start uh, P2Y12 receptor blockade in patients who are not going uh, to interventional management. Medical management uh, certainly benefits from P2Y12 receptor blockade unless there's a contraindication. Secondly, we'll talk about how long to continue blockade of this receptor. Uh, and third, we'll talk about uh, this issue of dual antiplatelet therapy, which currently is the standard of care in managing these patients. Dual antiplatelet therapy referring to the combination of aspirin and a P2Y12 receptor antagonist. Uh, there's now data suggesting that perhaps aspirin doesn't need to be continued as long as the P2Y12 receptor blockade so that we can try to reduce risk of bleeding without uh, seeing an increase in thrombosis risk. And then finally, we'll be taking a look at uh, some very interesting uh, new data uh, 
on perhaps which P2Y12 receptor to use in specific circumstances. So I'm going to turn the program over now to my colleague from Paris, Dr. Stegg, uh, to talk about the foundational role of antiplatelet therapy in ACS. Hello, I'm Gabriel Stegg. I'm a cardiologist at Hôpital Bichat in Paris, and I'd like to discuss today the foundational role of antiplatelet therapy in ACS. Now, this is a story that really started uh, in the previous century when aspirin was first established as the antithrombotic of choice in ACS patients. But 20 years ago, the landmark CURE trial is the trial that first established the benefit of adding a second antiplatelet agent to aspirin, a P2I12 inhibitor in the instance of clopidogrel. And as you can see here, uh, in the CURE trial, there was a rapid benefit of clopidogrel when compared to placebo on top of aspirin in non-ST elevation ACS patients who were, at the time, largely managed rather conservatively. Uh, it's interesting that most of the benefit accrues in the first days and months, and then is sustained up to a year. If we zoom in on the first 24 hours of therapy, we can see that during this period where most patients hadn't undergone PCI or angiography yet, there was already quite a, a clear-cut separation of the event curves in favor of the clopidogrel plus aspirin arm with a reduction in ischemic outcomes that was highly statistically significant. The uh, clopidogrel plus aspirin strategy was subsequently tested in two trials in STEMI patients. Uh, a few years later, the CLARITY trial was truly a patency trial plus lytic that showed a benefit of, in terms of patency of clopidogrel over placebo, but also a clinical benefit here in the instance of a reduction of CVSMI and recurrent ischemia. And a much larger Chinese study, the COMMIT randomized trial, included 45,000 patients of whom uh, roughly half had received reperfusion therapy in the form of lytic therapy and showed also a uh, reduction in outcomes, in improved, improved outcomes with clopidogrel, uh, specifically a 9% relative risk reduction in the risk of uh, uh, death, reinfarction, and stroke. So that established uh, dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel as the standard of care for most ACS patients. Now, clopidogrel is an interesting agent, an effective agent, but it might not be the ideal agent because it's a prodrug. It requires absorption by the gut and substantial processes of metabolism by the liver, which can be more or less efficient and can be slow, resulting in moderate and delayed uh, uh, inhibition of P2I12 uh, function uh, by the, uh, in, in the platelets. Prazogrel is another thionopyridine like clopidogrel that has a much quicker and a much more efficient metabolism by the liver, resulting in more consistent and more potent inhibition of the P2I12 receptor. Ticagrelor, finally, is a different agent. It's not a thionopyridine. It's not metabolized by the liver. It directly inhibits, in a reversible fashion, contrary to prazogrel and clopidogrel, the P2I12 receptor, which requires maintenance of a steady level in the plasma, and therefore BID, uh, 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 administration in contrast with prazogrel and clopidogrel. Um, and therefore, this, uh, these uh, pharmacokinetic considerations explain uh, most of the limitations of clopidogrel. Slow onset, slow offset because it's an irreversible agent, variable efficacy largely related to variation, variations in metabolism, which are to a large extent genetically determined, and mild, mild to moderate P2I12 inhibition. Now, Prazogrel uh, obtains, as I indicated, quicker inhibition, higher inhibition of P2I12. Whether this translated into clinical benefit was tested in the first large outcome randomized trial, uh, the Triton trial, which compared prazogrel to clopidogrel, specifically in PCI-treated ACS patients. And in that trial, there was a clear-cut benefit in terms of reduction of CVDSMI and stroke with approximately a 20% reduction with prazogrel compared to clop clopidogrel, Note that most of the benefit is uh, achieved quite early uh, during treatment in the first uh, days, if not hours, of therapy. There was also a price to pay in terms of bleeding with a roughly 30% increase in TME major bleeds that are not related to cabbage. Of note, there were three subgroups in whom the uh, benefit-risk uh, um, analysis appeared to be less favorable than the overall trial. Uh, 
Clearly, patients with a prior history of stroke or TIA had an unfavorable net clinical benefit, and these patients have a contraindication to this agent. And elderly patients above 75 years of age or low body weight patients below 60 kilograms are patients in whom there might be a less favorable net benefit uh, risk. And these patients should either be considered for a lower dose of prazogrel or maybe uh, treated with another agent. Now, there was another trial that tested prazogrel in medically managed ACS patients. That's the Trilogy trial, quite a large trial also. Uh, that trial did not find a reduction in uh, ischemic events, nor did it find an increase in TME major bleeding when uh, prazogrel was compared to clopidogrel in this medically managed patient population. Takagalor was tested uh, to, uh, compared to clopidogrel in the PLATO trial, also uh, an 18,000 uh, patient trial, so again, another large trial. And there was a reduction, a 16% reduction in ischemic events of CVDS MI and stroke with Takagalor compared to clopidogrel. What's interesting is that the population here is quite broad. It's all types of ACS, regardless of the management strategy that was selected. Patients could receive in the clopidogrel arm 300 or 600 milligram loading dose. And most important, two features are quite striking. The first one is that the benefit accrued over time. As we can see, there's continued separation of the event curves, suggesting that the longer you treat, the greater your benefit. And the other feature that's quite important is, of course, that there was a 20% reduction in cardiovascular deaths, as shown on the right panel, uh, that was highly statistically significant in favor of ticagadol compared to clopidogrel. Now, what was the price to pay? If we look at overall major bleeding, there was no difference in major bleeding, regardless of the way to characterize it, Plato, TME, red cell transfusion, Plato life-threatening bleeding, or even fatal bleeding appeared to be identical between the Ticagalor and clopidogrel treated arm. But if we look more closely, uh, it's interesting to note that two thirds of the bleeding was actually related to cabbage. So if you look at bleeding by intention to treat, yes, there is no difference. But if you exclude the cabbage related bleeds and focus on the non-cabbage related bleeds, which other trials such as Trident have done, uh, then you have a very typical and classical feature of an increased bleeding risk, statistically increased, statistically significant increase in bleeding risk with Ticagalor compared to clopidogrel which is totally in keeping with what we know of more potent platelet inhibition resulting in more bleeding. The results of uh, PLATO appeared remarkably consistent across subgroups. It was consistent uh, regardless of the management strategy, uh, which was stratified at the time of randomization, intent to be invasive or intent to be conservative, no interaction, consistent benefit. It was also true when you look at actual management, actually invasively managed patients versus actually conservatively managed patients. Uh, and, and also uh, quite consistent according to the demographics of the patients, regardless of age, body weight, and prior history of stroke. Again, a departure from Prazogrel. Now, this is the evidence base we've had for a few years, and it's interesting to look at what the guidelines say. And here are the European guidelines for STEMI patients managed with PCI. And the uh, grade 1A recommendation is aspirin, of course, and then a potent B12 inhibitor, prazogrel or ticagrelor, or clopidogrel, if these are not available or contraindicated, is recommended before or at latest at the time of PCI and maintained over 12 months. So I think very uh, conventional uh, recommendation. For patients who uh, have non-STEMI, Again, aspirin is grade one recommendation. A P2 12 inhibitor for 12 months is grade one A recommendation. And the options are prazogrel in P2 12 inhibitor in naive patients who proceed to PCI, grade one B. Ticagrelor, irrespective of the preceding P2 12 inhibitor regimen, grade one B. Clopidogrel, only when prazogrel or ticagrelor are either not available or contraindicated. What about maintenance therapy? Well, for maintenance therapy, I think it's interesting to note that uh, the recommendation grade 1A is 12 months of therapy unless there are contraindications such, an excessive, such as an excessive risk of bleeding. And the other interesting feature of the European guidelines is that in patients with MI and high ischemic risk who have tolerated that without a bleeding complication, Ticagero 60 mg BID for longer than 12 months on top of aspirin may be preferred over clopidogrel or prazogrel. And this is, I think, largely derived from the Pegasus trial grade 2B or uh, grade 2BB. What about uh, 
uh, medically managed patients, well, here again, DAPT uh, with P212 inhibitor therapy for 12 months, grade 1A. Ticagalor is preferred over clopidogrel unless the bleeding risk outweighs the potential ischemic benefit, grade 1B. Patients when managed with surgery have quite similar recommendations with the need to reestablish therapy after surgery once the bleeding risk is, is diminished. And finally, if we look at the US guidelines, the ACCHA guidelines from 2016, they're largely consistent with what we've seen in the European guidelines. I want to highlight four features. The first one is overall adapt with P2 12 inhibitor therapy for ACS patients receiving a stent is at least for 12 months, grade one. Secondly, um, in patients with ACS treated with DAPT after coronary in implantation, it's reasonable to use Ticagalor in preference to clopidogrel for maintenance, grade 2A. Likewise, for patients who are not at high risk of bleeding complications and who do not have a history of stroke or TIA, it is reasonable to use Frazogrel in preference to clopidogrel, so both options are valid. And finally, in patients who have tolerated bleeding, adapt without a bleeding complication, and who are not at high bleeding risk or do not receive oral anticoagulation, uh, anticoagulation. continuation of DAPT using clopidogrel, prazogrel, or ticagrel for longer than 12 months may be reasonable, grade 2BA, largely based on the DAPT trial, the Pegasus trial, and other similar studies. So I think we're seeing quite a nice uh, picture of DAPT recommendations uh, that to my eye, look more consistent than different across the pond. So the conclusions are DAPT has achieved tremendous success in improving outcomes after ACS, regardless of the management strategy, medical, interventional, or surgical. Clearly, novel oral P2I12 blockers are superior to clopidogrel, prazogrel for ACS patients undergoing PCI, PCI with the age, body weight, and prior stroke TIA restrictions. Ticagalor uh, acceptable for all ACS patients, regardless of management. And the duration of DAPT is to be tailored to the ischemic and bleeding risk. And I'm sure we're going to revisit this in the next few minutes. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Rob Story, cardiologist in Sheffield in the UK. So I want to focus on the balance of how we deal with ischemic risk versus bleeding risk and select patients for appropriate therapy. Now, one of the key issues that we have with patients following ACS is that some patients have unmodifiable risk factors. So risk factors are generally refractory to some of the secondary prevention therapies we use. And we see, for example, patients with very extensive atherosclerotic disease as manifest by polyvascular disease have high event rates. Similarly, patients with diabetes, which is much harder to modify the risk compared to things like hypercholesterolemia or hypertension, we see diabetes drives ongoing event rates. And as, this, as shown in this analysis, the combination of polyvascular disease and diabetes led to particularly high ischemic rates over the course of several years. But on the flip side, when we come to treating with antiplatelet therapy is the challenge of bleeding. And the observation that spontaneous bleeding major bleeding is associated with worse prognosis in terms of mortality. This analysis from Plato showed that those patients with spontaneous major bleeding had much higher mortality risk in the short term, i.e. one month after the bleeding event, and still some increase in risk beyond one month in the long term. Now, whether this is all causation or just association, because patients with high bleeding risk also tend to have higher ischemic risk, it is not clear, but clearly raises concerns and the aim to reduce bleeding wherever possible. In terms of identifying bleeding risk, a recent uh, consensus from the Academic Research Consortium for High Bleeding Risk in PCI came up with a series of major or minor bleeding risk criteria. Uh, some of these um, well recognized, such as use of anticoagulation driving increased bleeding risk, severe kidney disease, a major criteria, moderate chronic kidney disease, a minor criteria for bleeding, low hemoglobin, or prior hospitalization for spontaneous bleeding with greater risk if that was recent. And then obvious comorbidities such as liver disease, thrombocytopenia, 
or prior history of intracranial hemorrhage also raise concern about bleeding risk. And it's important to recognize that clinical trials of antithrombotic drugs have often excluded patients with the highest bleeding risk. So Pegasus TIMI-54, which assessed ticagrelor long-term therapy after MI, excluded patients with prior ischemic stroke, prior history of intracranial bleeding, anticoagulation, liver disease, or dialysis patients. And so the trial just selected patients who didn't have these high bleeding risk criteria. In the Pegasus data, we see that patients with these unmodifiable risk factors such as CKD have particularly high event rates. All the patients in Pegasus were somewhat selected for risk, but the CKD patients had particularly high risk. And along with that, a higher absolute risk reduction with ticagrelor. Similarly, patients with more severe coronary artery disease had higher event rates compared to those with single vessel disease and greater absolute risk reduction with ticagrelor compared to placebo on top of aspirin. And again, patients with peripheral arterial disease, i.e. polyvascular disease, very high event rates in terms of ischemic events and mortality with greater absolute risk reduction in those events with ticagrelor and not dissimilar increase in major and minor bleeding compared to those without polyvascular disease, and no signal in terms of intracranial hemorrhage. Overall in the trial, there was increase in major bleeding, but no significant difference in intracranial hemorrhage and no difference in fatal bleeding. So in a select population, we can achieve impressive risk reductions in terms of ischemic events, particularly in the higher risk patients, without an increase in fatal bleeding, but an increase in non-fatal major bleeding. Now, in this analysis of Pegasus, we looked at patients who were in the trial, but had bleeding risk factors that hadn't excluded them, but were identified as being of higher risk, and these are reflected in the uh, ARC criteria. So low hemoglobin or prior hospitalization for bleeding, this was a subgroup of patients when we looked at that who didn't seem to have uh, measurable benefit from ticagrelor uh, in, on top of aspirin. But if we took out this subgroup of patients with these bleeding risk factors and just looked at those with increasing levels of ischemic risk factors, we saw that those with more ischemic risk factors had the greatest absolute risk reduction with ticagrelor both in terms of MACE and also in terms of cardiovascular mortality. So how's this and other similar observations been incorporated into guidelines? So the 2019 ESC guidelines on the management of chronic coronary syndromes gave a 2A recommendation for adding a second antithrombotic drug to aspirin for long-term prevention in patients with high risk of ischemic events and without high bleeding risk. And in the footnotes, you'll see how we define high risk of ischemic events. That's patients with diffuse multivessel disease and one of these unmodifiable risk factors, diabetes, recurrent MI, PAD, or CKD. So that's high ischemic risk. And without high bleeding risk in, meant patients who didn't have one of the conditions listed here that is recognized to increase the risk of major bleeding events. And so if we select this population on the basis of ischemic and bleeding risk, then we can identify a population who we predict is going to derive the greatest absolute risk reduction and therefore also give us the greatest cost effectiveness. How can we incorporate these guidelines into clinical practice? Well, here's an example algorithm of how we can do this. On the right-hand side, following admission with MI and patients treated with dual antiplatelet therapy, it depends on the treatment strategy, but patients treated conservatively or with PCI, we then look at their ischemic risk, and they have, if they have a high ischemic risk, we then go down to make sure they don't have bleeding risk factors. If they do, we just treat with aspirin or monotherapy. But if they don't, then go on to prolong dual therapy 
over the long term, either with aspirin and ticagrelor or 60 milligrams as per the Pegasus study, or on the basis of subgroup analyses from other studies uh, using clopidogrel or prasugrel. On the left-hand side, we have the COMPASS uh, regimen with rivaroxaban. So again, looking at those with high ischemic risk, excluding those with high bleeding risk, can select patients for this uh, dual antithrombotic therapy strategy. So in summary, patients with unmodifiable ischemic risk factors remain at increased risk long-term following ACS. We see from many observational studies that spontaneous bleeding is associated with increased mortality. And that may be both causation, but also non-causative uh, association. Patients with high bleeding risk factors were either excluded from clinical trials or tended to receive less benefit from more intensive therapy. And this is really the rationale for guideline recommendations and algorithms such as I've shown for antithrombotic therapy regimens that can support individualized decision making and target this more intensive antithrombotic therapy long term on those who will derive the greatest absolute benefit without prohibitive bleeding complications. So thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Tobias Geisler. I'm a cardiologist at the University Hospital of Tübingen. In the following, Professor Seiner and I myself would like to discuss the impact of antiplatelet choice in secondary prevention with main focus on the recently published ISA REACT-5 trial, a trial that has been intensely discussed among cardiologists. I would like to give it a start by showing a case which we treated recently. A 70-year-old male patient who presented with a non-SD elevation ACS in our emergency department with chest pain since about four hours. He had a coronary three vessel disease, as you will see later on the angiographic findings. And as cardiovascular risk factors, he had a treated hypertension. There was no history of stroke in this patient. And in ECG, you see actually no signs of SD elevation in the extremity and chest leads. As you see here, there was an acute occlusion of the left circumflex coronary artery just before the bifurcation of marginal and posterior lateral branch. After recanalization of both branches, we performed bifurcational PCI using a reconstruction technique. And due to high thrombus burden, what you see here, and microvascular obstruction, there was a slow reflow. The right coronary artery was large and diffusely diseased with stenosis in medial segment and the posterior intraventricular artery. In addition, there were other high-risk features of this interventional case. The patient additionally had an osteo-left main stenosis. And as you can see in the spider view, the distal left main, in particular the ostium of the left circumflex, was affected, ending in a left main PCI and PCI of the osteal L6. In the end, there was a good result, which was also confirmed by IBUS, which is not shown here. And of note, the TIMI flow on the occluded left circumflex significantly improved. <clears throat> so I would like to address the question to the panel and the auditorium. How would you apply antiplatelet therapy in this situation? Would you have pretreated the patient with a P2 or receptor inhibitor? And if yes, which particular compound would you have chosen? Would the patient characteristics have affected your choice regarding dosing of P2 or inhibitor? And beyond the acute phase, would you have adjusted antiplatelet secondary prevention according to what we have learned so far? That is what the current guidelines recommend. Dual antiplatelet therapy should be applied for at least 12 months in both non STEMI and STEMI. Prosugrel should only be applied to non SD ACS patients who are naive to P12 inhibitor treatment and given only when indication for PCI is confirmed by angiography. These recommendations are mainly based on the results of the Triton trial, in which only patients undergoing PCI were enrolled, and the ACOS trial, in which pretreatment with prosugrel was hazardous with an adverse net benefit even in those who proceed to PCI. In contrast, we have data from the PLATO trial showing consistent results, regardless whether patients were pretreated with non-study drug P212 inhibitor or received study drug Tigerglor before invasive procedure. The guidelines further recommend that if pretreatment with non-STEMI is preferred, Tigerglor should be considered, or clopidogrel if Tigerglor is not an option. 
It has been the question for years whether there are benefits of one new P212 inhibitor over the other in ACS management. Before the results of ISO React were published, we had only data from an underpowered head-to-head -head trial, the PRAIG-18 trial, showing similar event rates with both agents. In the overall Plato and Triton TM38 trial, the event rates for Prosegol and Tigergol were similar for the primary efficacy endpoint. In Plato, in contrast to Triton, a relevant number of patients underwent medical management. When looking at patients who underwent invasive procedure and excluded patients who would qualify for low dose because of enhanced bleeding risk, um, the events rates for the efficacy endpoint remain similar. And with that, I would like to hand over to Dr. Zeimer, who will discuss as a react five before I come back to this case and uh, give the solution. Thank you. Hello, my name is Uwe Zeimer. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Ludwigshafen, Germany, and I will discuss uh, the clinical impact of the ISR REACT-5 trial. These are the current recommendations for dual antibiotic therapy issued by the European Society of Cardiology. And these include the recommendation for ticracrolor in patients um, <clears throat> with ACS, um, irrespective of the invasive or non-invasive approach in such a patient. While in contrast, uh, prasugrel should be going given only in patient undergoing PCI. So pregnant is not recommended uh, only in the patient with STEMI, which in over 90% will be treated with primary PCI. And uh, in patients uh, not treated invasively, uh, clearly ticracolor is the agent of choice. Are there any relevant differences between the agent with respect to platelet aggregation? Clearly, if we compare clopidogrel, even with a 900 milligram dose to the newer agent, prasugrel and ticacolor, you can appreciate that there is a more effective platelet inhibition with the newer agents. So even 900 milligram of clopidogrel will not do the job as good as the newer age. However, if you compare prasugrel and ticacolor, it seems that there is no difference with respect to the level of platelet inhibition between these two agents. And this has been studied in STEMI patients here in a randomized fashion patient where given prasugrel or ticacolor and inhibition of platelet aggregation has been measured. And as you can see here, no difference between the two drugs with respect to early inhibition of platelet inhibition. We have two large scale clinical trials where clopidogrel was compared to either prasugrel in the Triton trial or ticracolor in the Plato trial. And these are the results with respect to the primary endpoint, CV, DAS, MI, and stroke. And as you can see here, both agents, new agents were superior to clopidogrel. And this in turn has been associated with an increase in bleeding complication. If you just look on the results with respect to non cabbage related major bleeding, uh, there was an increase of 0.6% in both trials with Prasugrel and with Ticracolor. So the more effective platelet inhibition is associated with more pleadings. Now we have the first large scale clinical trial comparing these two new agents. And the initial assumption of the ISA REACT-5 trial was that Ticracolor was superior over Prasugrel. And uh, over 4,000 patients with ACS were randomized to either ticacolor immediately or prasugrel at the time of PCI. So this was not only a truck trial, this was a strategy trial as well, where patients with ticacolor received Ticacolor very early, while prasugrel was only given after decision to proceed to PCI. And 
Therefore, the loading dose has been given in almost 100% in the Tricacolor population in, in only 86% of the Prasocal population. So these patients not having significant stenosis of the coronary arteries or proceeding to cabbage did not receive Prasocal. Um, the analysis for the primary efficacy endpoint has been done for almost all patients in both groups, while the analysis for the safety endpoint, interestingly, has been done only for 700, uh, 1,773 patients in the Prasocal group and uh, 1,900 patients in the Tricracolo group. Here you can see the results with respect to the primary endpoint, which was a composite of death, MI, or non-fatal stroke. Uh, and interestingly, there was a reduction of this endpoint in favor of Brazocrel. So against the initial hypothesis, there was a benefit with Brazocrel compared to Tricracol. And I have said it before, usually if we compare antithrombotic therapy and we have one therapy which is more effective, we see an increase in bleeding complication. And this has not been the case in the ISAREACT-5 trial. If anything, there were less bleedings with this superior uh, therapy of Prasocrel and not an increase in bleeding complication with this more effective strategy. And this brings us to the point, are these results realistic? Here is a primary endpoint of the three large trials comparing two antiplatelet agents. Triton, clopidocryl versus protocryl, a reduction of 2.2%. Plato, clopidocryl versus ticacolor, a reduction of 1.9%. Now we have the two more effective agents. And despite this, and despite a lower event rate, there was a dramatic 2.4% absolute reduction in events. And it's hard to believe that this is realistic, given the fact that the antiplatelet effect of these two therapies, Ticracolor and Prasocryl, is almost identical. We now have a large meta-analysis of 12 randomized trials comparing P2Y12 inhibitors in patients with ACS. Clearly, there is a superior effect of prasocryl versus clopidogrel, which raises statistic significance with respect to MI and stent thrombosis, and there's a hint for a reduction in CV mortality, which does not uh, reach statistically, statistical significance. However, this comes with an increase in major bleeding complication. Um, if you compare Ticacolo versus Clopidogrel, here, interestingly, there's no effect of MI, but a lower cardiovascular mortality, a lower stent thrombosis rate comparable to the reduction with Prasocrel. Again, more bleeding complication in the um, same rate seen with Prasocrel versus Clopidocrel. Now, if you compare the two newer agents to each other, um, there seems to be less stent thrombosis with Prasocrel, no effect on cardiovascular mortality, no effect on major bleeding, and no effect on MI, at least in this meta-analysis. So what's my take on the choice of P2Y12 inhibitors after ACS? Clearly, if you have a patient with high bleeding risk, you should go for clopidogrel. If you have a patient which is handled conservatively, Ticacolor should be the agent of choice. For PCI, now we have two drugs which are equally effective, Prasocrel or Ticacolor. And I don't think that the 
results of the ESA REACT 5 trial would lead to the assumption that prazocal should be given in all the patients with uh, PCI. Having said this, I will hand over again to Tobias Geisler and see what his advice in his patient is. Thank you very much. So my conclusion from ISO REACT 5 is that what we heard before, that to date we have no other evidence from head-to-head -head comparison between the two compounds. In the future confirmative trials are unlikely. The results are surprising, also reflected by the initial contrary hypothesis of the investigators. I think from the background of mechanistic studies, the results are hardly to explain. Therefore, some question marks remain. There are some limitations that have been acknowledged by the authors, including the paucity of sites, the open label design, the randomization method, the follow-up and monitoring ways, and importantly, the fact that about 20% were not on the initially assigned study drug at hospital discharge. Noteworthy, despite the superiority in efficacy, there were also no signals on bleeding and other unexpected result in light of other antithrombotic trials, but probably explainable by the careful selection and dose reduction regime. This discontinuation, the discontinuation rates were higher with Tigoglor compared to Clopidogrel, but lower in the context of other trials. However, we don't have enough uh, information regarding temporary drug discontinuation from ISOREAC-5. The results of the ISOREAC-5 should be evaluated in the context of a very recent net network meta-analysis, which we heard before. Coming back to the case, how did we finally treat our patient? Before as a react, we probably would have used Tiger Law on this patient mainly because of the older age. Taking into account the as a react trial, some aspects might speak for Prozogel now. Actually, this was a STEMI equivalent with acute occlusion of the left circumflex and a high risk of stent thrombosis with a complex intervention. There are no reasons anymore to withhold Prozogel in the elderly. In fact, we loaded the patient with Prozogel 60 milligrams on the table and continued with a reduced maintenance dose therapy. Whether ISO REACT 5 provides sufficient evidence to routinely prefer Prozogel in ACS patients like this case undergoing PCI in light of the methodologic limitations, it's hard to say. I think we should be cautious not to overinterpret the data given the limitations. It will be interesting how the results will be implemented in the updated ESC non SD segment elevation ACS guidelines coming out soon and how they can be integrated in other strategies to reduce bleeding risk by early tigoglor monotherapy or de escalation strategies. My main conclusion from ISO REACT 5, although this is a well powered trial and the also should be commended for finalizing it, this trial does not really confine to a head to head comparison of two different drugs, but rather two strategies. With the results of ISO REACT, we have to question the impact of pre treatment once again, and even in those ACS patients heading towards PCI. To my point of view, the results of a direct comparison are difficult to interpret from ISO REACT 5, and it will make more sense to compare the two compounds to the same approach probably we won't have any other evidence from such a trial in the near future. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank my colleagues very much for those outstanding uh, reviews. Uh, and I look forward now to us having the opportunity to do some discussion amongst the panel. Uh, I think probably the most uh, controversial aspect of what we've been discussing today, although this early discontinuation of aspirin is still uh, obviously potentially uh, paradigm changing. But I, I think the, uh, the most interest comes from this uh, uh, discordant data that we got from ESAR REACT-5 that was not consistent with the, uh, with the previous data. Uh, obviously, we, we always look for the opportunity to have head-to-head -head trials, uh, but we look for head-to-head -head trials with, uh, uh, with good sound methodology and comparable groups. Uh, and as Dr. Geisler pointed out, ECR REACT-5 was actually a test more of, of two strategies than it was of two drugs. Uh, I've put here the, the highlights of that network meta-analysis, uh, which have already been uh, reviewed for you, but I call your attention as a, as a starting point for the discussion here to the, to the final bullet, uh, which is that there were no significant differences between Prazogrel and Ticagrelor for all outcomes explored. The other thing I'll point out is that consistent with the Plato results, uh, the Tacagrelor uh, use in ESRF, uh, excuse me, in the uh, network meta analysis uh, did show the same reduction in uh, CV mortality and all cause mortality compared to clopidogrel uh, that we saw in Plato. Gabriel, I'd, I'd like to give you, uh, as, as, our, uh, as who would have been our host in Paris for, for EuroPCR, I'd like to give you the last word if you want to give us a little bit of your commentary on the, uh, 
uh, the, the, the study itself and on how it might be operationalized. Well, you know, first of all, I think the ISAR React 5 investigators need to be commended for conducting a randomized trial. We need more randomized trials. We need more meta-analyses. Um, I, I think the trial is quite interesting. There are a number of features that um, have to be kept in mind when we look at the results, the uh, open label nature of the trial, the uh, quite substantial discontinuation rate and the asymmetric discontinuation rate. The fact that the magnitude of the treatment effect is somewhat discrepant with what we would expect based on prior trials, such as CURE, showing a 20% difference between clopidogrel and placebo, and Triton and Plato showing a 20 to 16% difference between the novel agents and clopidogrel. We wouldn't expect a, a much greater difference between the two novel agents themselves. And so I think we, we need to uh, look in more detail at, at this. And we also need to put this in the context of the broader evidence base we have as the recent meta-analysis of Navarrese and colleagues did, uh, looking at the totality of the randomized trial evidence. And uh, what this analysis does is essentially show that the guidelines are right. Uh, it's totally consistent with the guidelines. We need to use the novel agents whenever possible, uh, return to clopidogrel only in patients who are at very high risk of bleeding. And prazogrel has a profile that's really suited to PCI patients who go on immediately to PCI, either primary PCI or non-STEMI going immediately to PCI. And Ticagador is probably a, a very good agent across the board, regardless of management, a strategy, and timing of PCI. And I think these are reasonable uh, conclusions from this. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think the audience can tell we have the, the right group of experts here. We could discuss this uh, ad infinitum, but unfortunately, uh, the restraints of a, of a virtual meeting don't allow that. Uh, I want to thank uh, my faculty uh, for participating and bringing your expert commentary. It's, uh, it's a great reminder of how uh, the field of, of uh, secondary prevention of ACS and, and protection of patients after PCI continues to evolve, uh, both pharmacologically and also with uh, the advanced techniques that, uh, that you're able to use in the catheterization lab now. So this is still a, a developing story. We urge you to, to stay in touch and to, to stay up to date as new data are released. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. You see a link here on your screen to claim credit for uh, participating in this program. There's an online evaluation form that you do need to complete in order to receive your credit. And after you do that, a certificate will be emailed to the address that you give us in that evaluation form within two weeks. Thank you again for joining us.